We want to, instead of relying 100% on the economist's intuition, we want to rely still a fair amount on the economist's intuition, but also allow the data to influence that decision a bit more than a traditional approach would do, where the economist just sits down and says, I know how the world works, I run this regression, I get the right answer. Hello, I'm here at the University of Sussex for the Royal Economic Society Conference. I'm here with Chris Hansen, who is Professor of Econometrics and Statistics at the University of Chicago. And today we're going to be talking about econometrics. So what do you think econometrics is? So I think econometrics is easily defined just as uh, statistics for economists. Largely, we're developing methods that could be applied in any field of statistics. A lot of what statisticians are doing could be used by economists. The perhaps biggest thing that economists might claim econometrics is doing that statistics does less of is thinking very much about causal and structural inference. My own feeling after having worked with statisticians for more than a decade is they're spending just as much time thinking about that as we are, at least these days. Um, so I think really we should just say econometrics is statistics with a focus on economic data. You're more interested in the methods that econometricians and economists use. Could you tell me what you're most interested in right now? I personally do basically econometric theory, so or you know, statistical theory more generally. And right now, I, for the last few years actually, I've mostly been interested in the interaction of uh, what you might say are machine learning methods or big data methods and the sorts of questions that economists might like to answer. Could you give an example of a, a specific a, you know, a data set and a policy question? That... So in terms of economics, the um, sort of introduction of these methods has been slow relative to a lot of other communities. And I think part of it is economists often think we don't have big data or the questions we are interested in are causal and machine learning methods are typically for prediction. Uh -huh. I think that's wrong, but, <laughs> but I think that's a natural reason that it may, economists may have been slow to adopt or think about some of these methods. So in terms of big data that economists might use, examples that we see more and more are used in, say, demand modeling, where you have access to scanner data. Um, where we follow individuals over time, we set all of their purchases, and we want to try to understand consumer behavior. That's one example. And more generally, just you know, administrative data you get from like the census. The U.S. Census is a very large data set. So an example of the policy, a so, policy you might be trying to analyze might be the effect of a new tax on a particular kind of foodstuff, and, and you could use this data to analyze exactly. consumption and, and so, responses. Uh, exactly. So you might be interested in that. Um, you know, we've looked in are examples at things like um, demand elasticities. The things that I'm personally interested in are actual public policies, you know, so again, as a methods guy, the, I'm not going to try to oversell my own work in the, the policy standpoint, but we've looked at, you know, classic data sets or problems where we want to understand what's the effect of a 401k plan on people's savings. A 401k is a government provided um, subsidy to savings. So it's like an, an employer pension. That is exactly. It's, right. it's a form of retirement savings. Right. And again, the idea here is we have access to people's savings you know, records and we know whether plans are offered in their firms and we want to try to understand the relationship between their saving and the offering of this plan. The arguments made in the past is that when 401ks were introduced in the United States, okay, they were at that time new, and people were not deciding to work at a firm on the basis of whether the firm offered a 401k. So it was new, it was just not part of a person's choice set really. At the same time, people were deciding on you know, other features of the job, like how much was it going to pay. And how much a job pays is, of course, highly correlated to whether the job was the type that would offer a 401k. So if you try to understand the effect of a 401k without also controlling for the effect of income or wages, then it's impossible to tease these things out. Then to understand this effect, as we were talking about, you have to control for these other confounding variables. So you're not sure whether people are choosing the jobs because they're highly paid or because there's a 401k yeah, available. So that's kind of what you would like to tease out. And a traditional small data analysis would come up and the economist analyzing the data would say, well, when you say control for income, I know exactly how to do that. I just run a regression, which hopefully we all know and love, but we go out and we 
estimated standard statistical model, and in that statistical model, one of the variables that shows up is income. In principle, that would be fine if we knew for sure that income was really the only thing that was confounding with this policy variable we cared about, and if we knew that to adequately control for income, all we had to do was look at it in the lens of a simple regression model. All right, unfortunately, that's kind of made up. Okay, so what a big data style approach would look at is saying that there are actually lots of features of jobs. And what we mean by we need to control for income is not necessarily we run a linear regression, so we might need to do something more elaborate than that to adequately control for income. What big data is going to try to do, or you know, the methods we're developing, which are machine learning style methods, is they're going to try to learn not only what variables you really do need to control for, so maybe it's not just income, maybe there are other things, and then you also want to learn how these variables actually interact and influence the outcome more generally than what you get out of just a traditional linear regression model, for example. So in big data, the, the data is so rich, there are so many things in the data that it gives you much more gives you freedom a, to, to draw out lessons Exactly, from it gives data. you a lot of flexibility. It, in fact, gives you too much flexibility, which is where economists have always, and all traditional statisticians, they've always gotten rid of the too much flexibility by imposing a priori, I know the right thing to do. Okay. And what more modern machine learning style methods are trying to do is impose some structure, because without it, it's impossible to learn, but to impose structure that is also consistent with the data and is not simply imposed a priori by the person analyzing the data. And sometimes you end up getting the exact same results. Right, right. So in the 401k example, which we have reanalyzed, we get the exact same results, I mean, not exact same, but effectively the same results as the original people who analyzed this problem 20 years ago. I mean, that, that's comforting. And that's reassuring. It, yeah. There are other examples where we have looked at, and so we've reanalyzed um, the you know, abortion example from Steve Levitt. The basic idea is they want to understand, is there a causal association between abortion and crime? And in order to do that, again, abortion is not randomly assigned, so they have to control for a variety of factors that they thought were associated to abortion rates and crime rates to be able to try to pretend or assume that they had understood this causal effect. When we reanalyze that example, again, one particular specification from that paper, I want to be very clear, we find quite different results than what they find in that it after being careful and allowing the data to tell you what you should control for, rather than just imposing a priori, I know what to control for, we end up finding that there's no evidence in the data that there, that there is a causal link between abortion and crime rates, which is not the same as, and the, as in the original paper. And so I want to caveat that. We've only looked at one of many, many pieces of evidence in that paper. But in that one particular example, you can see how directly imposing your beliefs without allowing the data to inform you with all this rich information that was available, what you should use, you might draw perhaps incorrect conclusions. Right, so the more flexible approach means that you're more likely to get you know, the right policy. Exactly, so policy you essence. are more flexible, you are in some sense more plausible in the conclusion you're drawing. Now the cost of being more flexible is more computation and of course, you know, everything can go wrong, That's, I don't want to oversell anything. Um, and you know, if you really, really did know the truth, you would be better off using the truth. And I guess my personal feelings are that we don't really know the truth and we should let the data help us a little bit in trying to figure out what really is going on. But that's a belief statement and I have no, you know, again, there's nothing in the data that would for sure tell me I'm right. So if there's one thing that economists should take away from your research, what's the, what should that be? So I think what economists have always been aware of is the importance of having a plausible story for why you can draw a causal conclusion from observational data. And the methods that we've been developing and are, are coming in from big data are allowing us to expand the set of plausibility, for lack of a better term, and make our conclusions more reliable and more believable without imposing so much directly just from our heads. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, it was a pleasure.